Welcome everyone to the second day of the Inharmonic Controllers and Interfaces for Keyboard Instrument Symposium. And I'm just going to give a very brief opening to the workshops because we're going to have three workshops today for two new instruments that um, I was part of a team that we developed and worked on that were presented at the first symposium and are also presented more in depth today. And we also have a very special instrument here called the Lumitone, which we will also have a presentation of by Mark later in the afternoon. And I will leave that completely to him. Um, so uh, just to begin with the, the three things I'm primarily going to discuss is um, without spoiling things uh, for later, uh, because everyone else is going to explain these things a little bit more in depth, um, is for start, how can keyboards be modified to accommodate notes outside of the standard 12 tone equal temperament tuning that they're tuned in. And um, so unlike some instruments that have the ability to modify tuning during playing, like string instruments, or if you're singing, or even wind instruments, you, you listen and adjust your tuning based on performance. Keyboard instruments are tuned, and the tuning is more or less uh, set. And although many people have done things to uh, adjust the tuning and make more things possible, and that is what I'll talk about. And why would we want to modify them? So I'll talk about some of the things we did leading up to the symposium last year and some things that were created this year um, and basically what these can bring to uh, new music. And uh, also, why are we using digital technology? Because you've probably noticed over the last couple of days that all of the enharmonic or microtonal instruments that we've demonstrated have been using um, digital technology rather than acoustic instruments. Um, the three instruments that are demonstrated in these workshops are the microtonal e-piano, which is actually a software that interfaces with the piano. Um, the extension for this Viscount called the Frescovaldi Squared Extension, and also the Lumitone. So the primary question that uh, led us into the symposium last year and the development of these instruments is, how can keyboards be modified to accommodate pitches outside their ubiquitous 12 note equal temperament tuning? And while also balancing performance paradigm is something I have in parentheses, because this is something that was sort of in our minds as we were developing the Frescobaldi, and it's also in my mind as I um, am developing pieces for the, for the e-piano. Uh, obviously, one of the, the one ways that you can add notes or increase uh, notes outside of 12 uh, tone ET is by adding keys. And historically, this uh, has been uh, done already in the 16th century, most commonly. And um, there were, for example, keys added because they started using tuning and temperament that required certain uh, thirds. Klaus talked about this a lot yesterday, so I won't go into any more detail than that. Um, but there are also many instruments that were described and were never really constructed that um, some people have taken an interest in constructing in recent years. Um, there's an example here, uh, Clever Musicum Omnitonum, uh, which was reconstructed by Studio 31 Plus. They've also reconstructed several other of these instruments, um, but the acoustic versions of them, and that's, if you're interested in <coughs> these type of instruments, definitely look them up. <coughs> Um, but also there's an image here of the Vakel Orgel from, uh, that is in Wien, and it's actually the oldest organ in Vienna, correct? I believe it says. And um, this was my first experience working with something that had uh, split keys or added keys. And there are some, you can see in the image, there are just a couple added keys uh, of, um, to the, so that there is a D sharp and E flat accessible and a D sharp and A flat accessible so that you can access some more pure thirds. There are also more modern examples, especially in the 20th century when people started to experiment with uh, further and further divisions of the octave. Um, there became instruments that are more or less having more or less amounts of keys. Um, for example, there is the sixth tone harmonium uh, developed by Hava. And this is, uh, many people are familiar with this. There's a lot of music in recent years being created for this instrument. There's sort of a renewal um, at the moment. Um, but then you have instruments that even go as far as the orthotonophonium, which has 72 keys per octave and um, looks extremely difficult to play. 
because the more keys you begin to add, the more it starts to diverge from the, the performance paradigm that a keyboardist would be familiar with. The other option is to retune existing keys. And um, at the very basic level, many synthesizers and keyboards now have this ability to change between presets and tunings. The Viscount organ, which is sitting right here, is an example of this because you can basically set from or select from a menu um, which tuning you want to use. So, and there's a multitude of them. Also, there is an E organ at um, here in Graz at the university that has uh, many different tuning systems. And this was my first example working with like an instrument where I could change the tuning system within the piece and it was actually embedded into the composition and which I guess kind of started the interest in this sort of um, realm of, of composing and exploring keyboard instruments. And also people have developed controllers for this that can go into more detail of how they work with the um, uh, tuning. Um, but also there are uh, commercial products such as the Rolly Rise um, where you have more control because where you touch the key can adjust the tuning. Um, yeah. This is also possible on um, acoustic instruments. Uh, obviously you can retune manually, um, but there are some devices. For example, um, Kari Ikonen has developed a Macchiano this was already discussed in depth last year uh, when Matthias Sebastian Kruger gave his demonstration and he uh, had composed works including these, but they're essentially magnetic devices that you can place on each string to adjust the tuning of it. And this is for an acoustic piano. Our team has sort of developed an option that uses both of these sort of possibilities. The first is this dynamic retuning system that is working in Max MSP, and that was developed by Martin Ritter uh, with enhancements by composers, because he basically had the, the basic software and um, encouraged all the composers to have their own ideas and really try and do whatever they wanted with the tuning, and every composer came up with something completely different and had a different way of implementing it. Um, and then there is the Frescobaldi squared, which was developed by the Organon group. And that is essentially a keyboard extension that rests on the organ and it adds extra keys to each octave. I'm just going to show a short video of the dynamic retuning in Max MSP. So you can see that even when Forrest is pressing the same key that the pitch is changing and so that the retuning is happening in real time, which was an important uh, aspect of this software. And so essentially the software, I will leave the more details for the workshop, but it effectively interfaces between Max MSP and a MIDI keyboard and it allows real time and dynamic changes of pitches on an electronic keyboard. Um, the possibilities are completely numerous, so whatever you can think of, you can try. And um, from the performance perspective, uh, the advantage is that, of course, the, the key setup is identical to how it works for a pianist. So there's no change to the actual physicality. However, depending on how differently you retune it, there can be a very strong auditory conflict between what the performer is actually playing and the sound that is produced. And um, that's also something that we can discuss in the workshop, how that impacted the performer's experience. Uh, secondly, we created this um, 
extension, which is the Fresco Valdi Squared. And we began creating this in October and we are continuing to develop it. The version that we were performing on yesterday was our original prototype, but we also have a newer version that is not uh, performance complete, but it's in progress and has a lot of uh, improvements made to it that we can uh, demonstrate. And this instrument was uh, kind of developed because uh, Klaus, when we were uh, discussing this, this workshop, which is originally last year supposed to be just based around the ePiano software, um, Klaus mentioned this dream he had of some kind of controller that could allow uh, switching between uh, two different um, pure thirds on a keyboard to basically create a split key um, controller. And the original idea was some kind of sensor that we could implement that would uh, change which intonation came out of any given black key. But as we were developing it, um, it sort of morphed into more of a just addition of keys that is really a more uh, based on how split keys work so that people would have access to both keys at the same time. And so it kind of grew into this physical extension that is placed on a keyboard. And uh, we developed this in our research group, which is called Organon. And we are investigating the potential of organ in new music and the uh, further possibilities for organ. We originally started to make materials for composers uh, that were curious about writing for organ and just didn't know where to start so that they could have some kind of information because we noticed that there was a lack of this um, that was maintained and um, recent. Um, although there were some resources, there weren't very many. Um, and so we developed this and then we started to develop uh, other things such as the Frescobaldi. And this was developed through a prototyping research grant originally here, so that's how we designed this prototype. And we presented it here and it was performed um, in the state it was uh, complete in, it was performed on, and uh, we've also given presentations on it elsewhere um, since. So you can see that it's basically a device that attaches to this um, E organ and uses a Raspberry Pi, so we actually don't use a, a computer at all. It uses a Raspberry Pi to interface uh, with the Viscount and um, essentially allows other pitches to be accessible. Um, now we're working, of course, on a new design because one of the primary issues with the the, the Viscount is that we had used computer buttons because they're more reliable in terms of data and in terms of uh, debugging. So just to get all of the software working and to make sure that it was reliable, we have a, the keyboard actually contains sort of these like 3D printed um, shells for actual keyboard buttons. Um, but this is not very uh, uh, ergonomic or not very physically normal for the player. And so we started to redesign the keys and also redesign the system so that it could be able to fit more um, different organs and different keyboards and could be more expandable. And so we started to design something that was more modular, that uh, has pieces that fit together and um, based on which pieces you fit together, it's a certain length. And then the keys, which have a different mechanism for how they are interacted with and that they also are uh, sort of placed into this, this apparatus so that they can be moved freely throughout the keyboard rather than being fixed. The benefits of this, why we thought it would be interesting to pursue and to continue to pursue is that it can attach to any keyboard. So rather than buying a keyboard that already has a split key system, somebody could just get this device. We were thinking of this as being a, a, a large benefit that uh, not everyone can, while there are so many uh, controllers that are developed with split keys, um, that not everyone maybe can buy a full external keyboard. 
Um, it's also extremely portable. So even the, the wooden one that we have that's quite long and not uh, disassemblable, um, we've traveled with it. Uh, we even traveled across the Atlantic with it. Um, and it's relatively easy to, if it's desired, to retain a keyboard performance paradigm. Um, because you can add, for example, five keys per octave. We want the, the newer version is more expandable, but it already is built on this paradigm that was um, a model already uh, in early music where they had split keys and added keys in this manner. Um, but these things make it different from a lot of existing um, split key or inharmonic or microtonal keyboards, which are often more bespoke and made for what the performer is trying to, to do and what their, um, or the, whoever's developing the instrument and what the harmonic system they're trying to create is. Um, so I just would like to briefly get into some of the things that have already been done for these instruments. Um, so this is the second question, which is what are some of the possibilities afforded by modifying these keyboards? Um, first, I just want to show something really quick that has absolutely nothing to do with uh, writing keyboard music to show that it, it goes a little bit beyond this. And um, this is just a short piece that I composed for a concert last year. Um, so basically, this was a, I was asked to compose a, a series of, of small, um, like, short fragments that were to be performed in between fragments by Nicola Vicentino. And uh, Nicola Vicentino and the Archicembalo was already mentioned in, in last year's uh, symposium, but for anybody that is not familiar, it was this instrument that was uh, written about and that has actually now been reconstructed again by Studio 31 Plus. Um, in which there are several split keys on uh, two different uh, keyboards. And um, the reason that I, I brought this up in the context of this particular presentation and in this particular conference is that because the group was singing uh, song, uh, fragments by Vicentino as well as pieces that I had to write that were inspired by Vicentino and that made use of this tuning, they somehow needed to figure out how to intonate these. And they tried with audio recordings, but in the end, um, what they did was they actually used digital keyboards to mock up the tuning. Um, well, almost mock it up because there's also the, the extra added keys that are missing, but they did the best they could to mock up what they needed to mock up. And I thought that this shows that there is another, um, this is another sort of uh, possibility of designing these kind of instruments is that you can also use them in the context of needing to rehearse and that having digital keyboards that can be reprogrammed um, allows people to do this because the biggest reason that they needed to do this is that they did not have an archicembalo because they, this is just not an instrument that is as ubiquitous as a piano at the current time. Um, of course, these can be used also for performing early music. Last year we had a, a performances of several um, uh, early works from the 16th century primarily. So um, Klaus played pieces by Frescobaldi, Froberger, and Mayone. Um, and this year, uh, in addition to the early music that was performed last night, 
Um, Forrest will also perform a piece by Michael Passaro Lou, which was originally composed for retune acoustic piano. And so normally we would, to perform this, you would have to actually retune an acoustic piano, but we are using the software to perform it in this context. Um, last year, we also invited six people to compose pieces for e-piano. Um, and they all used, many of them used multiple tuning systems within the same piece. And they also used a variety of different type of tuning systems. So despite the fact that we didn't necessarily tell anyone what to do or give them any kind of guidance, everyone did something completely different. We had equal divisions of the octave that were anywhere from 1 to 1048 <laughs> and many other standard and custom tuning systems that people made. I'm just going to show a couple of short clips of some of the pieces from last time so you can get an idea of some of the sounds that are possible. Oops, sorry. So this is one example. And then taking an, a different approach is um, Pablo's piece. I just wanted to show in complete contrast to that as like something totally opposite. Um, Sepe Kabasian made a piece which actually used different kinds of scales and um, the sound was quite different. So from the other two that I have already showed. So I'm just going to begin. This.
So all three of those examples had very different um, implementations of the exact same software. And I think that the, having this kind of freedom allowed for many different types of um, conceptual ideas to come forward, whether they came from kind of ideas of exploring pianistic um, physical things or uh, expanding uh, equal divisions of the octave or implementing uh, different scales that aren't normally playable by standard pianos. Um, uh, sorry, there's a mistake on this. It's actually 2023. There were new works composed for the extension. Um, so four composers wrote pieces that were specifically composed for the Fresca Bali squared extension. And um, two of them are solos and two of them are duets. At the moment, the extension is slightly less flexible, so they were um, fixed to that. Um, and most composers did use it as five added keys to quarter comma. Um, one did not. Um, and that I'll discuss in a minute. Um, so we had uh, two, pe two solo pieces, one by Etusa Filamazian and one by Sefer Carbassian. And so, for example, um, in Etusa's piece, there were a lot of chordal structures and the use of the fresco baldi was um, often m contrasting between the, the enharmonic notes and how they work with the chordal structures. Um, in Sefer's piece, he used the Frescobaldi a lot in very fast, um, rapid, um, small, almost like timbre trill motions to sort of sort of highlight the the enharmonic difference. And so I thought it was interesting that they actually both really used and implemented this enharmonic as a very like highlighted almost timbral focus um, rather than something functional in a way. Um, so they had almost the, sa the same approach, but yet two very different uh, realizations of it. And actually, I thought were very effective. Um, I also composed a piece that is for both instruments, the e-piano and the frescobaldi, which will be performed in a concert tonight. And um, in this piece, I have the e-piano beginning in a quarter comma mean tone and the viscount also, but with the added and inharmonic keys. And over the course of the piece, every one of the 12 notes in the e-piano systematically shift over the course of the piece up 41 cents. And then I, at the end, I'm, I have this focus on some of the harmonies that, that actually line up, because as the e-piano shifts, there are, of course, three pitches that it begins to line up with in the fresco baldi. So I can just show my the way that I tuned the e-piano and um, for the particular software we're working with, uh, we put everything in sense deviation. I understand these are approximated sense deviations, so everything is rounded to the nearest decimal point. Um, and uh, basically throughout the course of the piece, it has 13 tuning changes, so that it starts at a given tuning system and it ends at a given tuning system. And that by the end, the, the, the three added keys that are added to um, the the, the sharps are in conjunction with the E piano keys. And I actually use that as a compositional concept. And so it shows the ways in which I was influenced by these two devices. Um, Martin Ritter wrote a piece for both of these instruments that takes a completely different approach and um, uses the flexibility of the software to design a system. So he started with the E piano, retuned to various overtone series. So basically the bottom octave of the E piano, rather than functioning as a piano, works as a controller. And every time a key is pressed, the entire piano is retuned to an overtone series of the note that was pushed. Um, and all these retunings are actually based on the overtones of the C scale. So they're retuned to the overtone and not to the equal tempered pitch. Um, at the same time, the E organ is in equal temperament, but all of the pitches of the extension are tuned to odd partials in the C overtone series. Um, I also thought it was interesting because in this piece, um, the way he notated the keyboard extension, it actually got its own staff um, because it was used in a way that is not uh, standard for uh, split keys. And so the piano, uh, I just want to show the retuning uh, that um, even though chromatic scale is being played, each note is a successive pitch of an overtone series. And that the way the fresco baldi is retuned um, rather than being the sort of the standard and harmonic cues as they relate to the quarter comma mean tone is uh, also retuned to um, other um, harmonic pitches. 
or sorry, like harmonics and partials. Um, and here is the, uh, the score so that you can see that there was a separate staff given for the fresco keys um, rather than implementing it um, on the staff as the other pieces because they worked with the enharmonic notes rather than retuning. They notated as you would enharmonic pitches. Uh, briefly, I just want to describe why we decided to choose um, using digital technology, other than the fact that we are all computer musicians and this is our area of expertise. Um, digital keyboards are adaptable, uh, so we can retune without uh, physical adjustments, which makes it easy for experimentation. It also makes it very feasible to explore different things very fast. Um, and that also in gives us a multitude of possibilities to work with, um, some that do work, some that don't work. Um, and it's also extremely easy for us to replace the parts and to deal with things breaking. Um, so from a practical standpoint, uh, we find that it's, it's good for this sort of experimentation. Um, it's also very measurable. So there's lots of digital tools we can use for measurement. Um, we are setting everything at a very fixed digital level. And so it's giving us a level of control and um, assessment that we uh, prefer and like to use at this moment. However, there are a lot of drawbacks, um, including that technology is very fickle. Um, it requires a lot of testing, um, so there's a lot of possibilities, but it also means that there's a lot of possible errors. Um, some come up that we have no idea why, and um, so it's a constant process that always takes much longer than you would expect. Uh, failure is extremely common, um, and there's a sort of lack of reliability. Um, Computers sometimes aren't in tune, so there's this issue that came up with the Frescovaldi when we were working on it that I found very interesting, that the samples that we tuned on our computer, when we uh, checked them on the computer, the tuning was correct, and as soon as we put them on the Pi, the Raspberry Pi, even just uh, playing them back, they were out of tune with the playing on the computer. And that was after checking every other factor that could have influenced it, um, so sometimes there's just strangeness, and then very inexplic inexplicable problems. Um, yesterday after rehearsing, the uh, keyboard was only outputting velocity of 64, and we actually, the only way to solve this is to reset the MIDI keyboard. So sometimes there's strange behaviors. Um, and obviously there's the sound quality that you're lacking, the sound quality that you get with acoustic um, instruments. But um, we feel that a lot of the benefits and the possibilities that we are afforded are extremely useful and make them very valuable tools. So I hope that this short introduction has made you curious and interested uh, about what these devices are capable of. Uh, right now, I would, there's no questions. Um, save any questions, concerns, comments, sketches, ideas uh, for the workshops so we can explore these fantastic instruments in more detail. Thank you.